Hi, this is Andrew, and this is Keynote, the daily now.tv chat show with some of the world's leading thinkers and writers. Hello, everybody. It is July the 4th, 2023. We're now more than two weeks uh, after the uh, catastrophic uh, implosion of the Titanic sub that tragically killed all five explorers uh, on board. Uh, but even today, um, pieces have been recovered from the sea floor, so we're learning more and more about it. Uh, the aftershocks are more than just physical. More and more people are concerned that it might have an impact on how we think about the ocean, maybe even explore it. James Cameron uh, has recently said that uh, he's worried that uh, it will discourage citizen explorers, quite understandably. I'm sure their families will discourage them. Um, of course, there is an enormous uh, passion and joy for exploration uh, about the deep sea, which is what drove these uh, these people on, on the submarine. It's a huge tragedy. And one person, I think, who understands that passion and joy for exploration is my guest today. Uh, Laura uh, Trithui uh, is an ocean journalist, an ocean explorer and writer. Uh, she's dedicated her life in many ways to the ocean. She was based in San Diego. Now she's back in Hamilton, Ontario. She's the author of a couple of books on the ocean. Uh, Imperiled Ocean, Human Stories from a Changing Sea, and uh, her newest book, it's actually out uh, next week, The Deepest Map, The High Stakes Race to Chart the World's Oceans. Tragically, of course, it's very relevant in the context of the Titanic sub-disaster. Uh, Laura, as I said, is joining us from Hamilton, Ontario. Laura, welcome. Um, the, the the disaster must have resonated particularly with you. Uh, tell me about your impressions, not just of the disaster, but the way in which it was received. Yeah, so this uh, Titan, Titan implosion was uh, a really a long time coming in the ocean exploration world. So there's, in my book, The Deepest Map, uh, a big part of the book is sort of highlighting this push and pull between private money and ocean exploration and who gets to explore the deep sea. So a big part of the book follows a private expedition that was paid for by a businessman adventurer called Victor Vescovo, who wanted to dive the deepest points of all five oceans. And the book kicks off with Vescovo trying to recruit ocean mappers and scientists to come aboard his ship and go all over the world with him, diving these points. And a few of the scientists are, you know, quite rightly skeptical of him because at the time he was sort of an unknown in the ocean exploration world. And for years there had been this trend in ocean exploration where rich people were, were founding organizations and buying research vessels just as government support was, was flatlining. And scientists were concerned about, you know, rich people setting research priorities that weren't informed by science and that the scientists were there as sort of like window dressing, a chance to sort of burnish their legacies. And Victor Vescovo, in my eyes, eventually proved himself to be, you know, a great supporter of science and research. But as I was trying, as I was covering his expedition for the book, I tried to get a ride on a submersible myself. And I spoke to many private submersible operators and scientific institutions, and really no one recommended asking Ocean Gate expeditions for a ride. And I heard some pretty dire warnings about the company too. So it was sort of an open secret in the community that the science they were doing was maybe all not all that credible because, you know, what's the scientific value of diving Titanic again and again and again when so little of the deep sea has been explored? And then also this was, you know, a commercial operation and they weren't following regulations and guidelines. And so no one could really air some of these, these concerns publicly because of legal reasons, but people were really concerned that someone was going to get killed. And so this tension really just really blew up with the Titan imploding just two weeks ago. Do you share James, Car James Cameron's concerns about uh, the impact of this disaster on citizen explorers? Presumably people like Vescova aren't going to be discouraged. 
No, I don't think so. I think Viscovo and some of these other sort of private explorers, they've sort of ex accepted the risk to themselves. Um, when the, you go off to do exploration, it's naturally sort of dangerous. Um, I'm not as concerned about the risk to deep sea tourism. I support people exploring the deep sea, but I want them to do it safely and I want them to do it for science. And so I'm, uh, I don't really share that concern. I think that we do sort of need to slow down and think about what this moment means and sort of refocus deep sea exploration on science and, and doing it safely. It's odd. We live in this new age of exploration, uh, both of the ocean and of the universe. Are there similarities? I mean, somebody like Vescovo reminds me, I guess, in some ways of, of Elon Musk or Jeff Bezos and these uh, entrepreneurs, these wealthy people trying to explore the universe. We did a show actually about that uh, a few months ago. It, are there equivalents morally, economically, and perhaps even geographically between uh, discovering the ocean, which we know very little about, you note that in the book, um, and the universe, which obviously we don't know very much about either? Oh, absolutely. I mean, a big inspiration for this book was this sort of cliche that we know more about um, the moon and Mars than we do the seafloor. And so a big, as an ocean journalist, you hear this line all the time in ocean journalism. And every time I heard this this cliche again and again, I always wondered, you know, why? Why are we? Ex why do we know more about the moon and Mars than we do the seafloor? And so a big part of this book was sort of digging into the why and figuring out why we care about these distant planets more than we do our own, our own planet. I guess the obvious response, I mean, is we can look up at the stars, but we can't really look down uh, at, at, at the ocean. Are there in your, uh, I guess this is guesswork, really, but are there still profound secrets that we know nothing about? I mean, could we discover stuff under the ocean that it's unimaginable? Um, I mean, the, the answer to that is sort of yes and no. I mean, we, one of the greatest mysteries of all time, in my opinion, is still down there. Um, and that is how did life begin on earth? We know that it started somewhere on the seafloor and we've got some good candidates for where it might have began. So one of them is this place in the Atlantic called the Lost City, which is just like, please look it up, like look up images of it. It's just this hydrothermal vent field of kind of spiraling uh, steaming vents. Um, it looks like something out of Lord of the Rings. And um, this is like one of the places where life might have begun, but we still don't know. Um, and this, my, this, this, this place was recently slated as a prospective mining site. So, um, you know, we may end up destroying some of these fascinating mysteries, such as the, you know, the origins of humanity and life on Earth before we end up sort of mapping and exploring them. What about the environmental aspects of this? We've done many shows, as you can imagine, on the environment and the ocean, one with uh, Farah Obedullah, uh, you probably know her work. Uh, she has a new book out, The Ocean and Us, which she focuses on the environmental issues associated with preserving the ocean. Um, how much of that do you touch on in The Deepest Map? So the sort of biggest environmental topic that I touch on in the book is really the advent of deep sea mining. Um, a big question that I got while I was writing this book was, you know, as soon as I told somebody the premise of the book, which is that um, it follows a bunch of ocean mappers as they're trying to finish the first complete map of the ocean, um, people would ask, so like, why are they making this map? And what are they going to do with this map? And people would rightly say, like, they would make the connection to mines and ex exploitation and extraction. And, you know, they're not right. Uh, they're not wrong in assuming that um, there's actually a big push on right now to mine the deep sea. So actually, in the next week or so, a bunch of government delegates are going to be meeting at the deep sea mining regulator in Jamaica, where a, a rule is about to expire that has protected the deep sea from commercial mining for the last few decades. 
And um, once this rule expires, it could really pave the way for commercial deep sea mines on the seafloor as soon as 2024. And we really have no idea what those mines are going to do. It's a gigantic experiment on the seafloor. And what's worse is that it's going to be covering just huge, unimaginably vast <laughs> areas. Like these mining sites are unreal in terms of their size because they're in the ocean. So one ocean researcher estimated that uh, a contractor, one mining contractor would have to tear up between 300 to 600 square kilometers every year to turn a profit. So we really can't even imagine just how, how much land or seafloor is going to be churned up looking for, for minerals. And so, so yeah, so there's huge environmental consequences. And, and the that. economics are also in, interesting and complicated. Um, we did a show with a couple of uh, UK-based academics, Liam Cambling and Alejandro Colas, um, on the relationship between the ocean and capitalism. I mean, who owns the stuff under the ocean? How, how do you get permits or rights to mine the ocean? Yeah, that's such a good question. I mean, the answer is a little bit mm, in the weeds. So, you know, bear with me a little Excuse bit. Excuse the pun, right? <laughs> Exactly. Um, so technically, uh, no one owns international waters. They are legally classified as belonging to the common heritage of mankind. So no one owns them and everyone sort of abuses them. It's sort of this classic tragedy of the commons uh, going on out on the high seas, which is where you get things like um, cruise ships and you get industrial fishing fleets. And now you may potentially have deep sea mining going on as well. And it's just a really murky, difficult place to regulate. Um, there has been some good news on this recently. So recently, a, a massive treaty was adopted by the UN to protect the high seas and to put a certain amount of the area into a marine protected zone. So for the first time, the deep sea could get some kind of protection, which it's never really had. But in general, it's, it's just been used and abused for decades, the, the international waters. Laura, um... A couple of months ago, we did a show uh, with a historian who wrote a book about a 17th century Venetian cartologist um, who, who invented the first real global map of the world. Uh, and of course, all this is bound up in the Venetian and then later European colonization of the world. How much of the attempt to map the ocean, what you call this high stakes race, is history repeating itself in terms of European colonization of the world and the role of maps and, and cartographers in this process? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's a really great question. Um, CIPA 2030, which is this organization that I follow throughout the book, um, so I'm sort of following a couple of different threads, but the main thread is about CIPA 2030, which is a group of academic scientists who are trying to, or academic mappers, who are trying to create the first publicly available free map of the seafloor. Kind and of so, an open source map, so to speak. Exactly. So hopefully it would be different than all these other maps that have come before them. So, you know, some of the maps that were owned by Spain and Portugal and the secret atlas that was kept by the Dutch for years and years and years. Um, maps in many ways were sort of the way to money and wealth and empire, particularly nautical charts. And so CBIT 2030 is trying to upend that by giving these maps away and making them publicly and free freely available to whoever wants them. But at the same time, I mean, there's still the sort of impacts and hangover of colonialism on these maps that you see today that are you know, publicly available because the developed countries of the world have the best maps and the poor and developing countries have the worst maps. So, um, so it's still sort of reverberating today. And of course, in our digital revolution, uh, mapping and access to mapping and monetization of mapping has been revolutionized over the last 20 years. Uh, is much of the mapping now, this high stakes race, is it an analog race or, or a digital one? Yeah, that's a great, uh, that's a great question and uh, a huge issue in the industry right now. Um, when CIPA 2030 first launched, they said that they were going to map 85% uh, of the ocean, the remaining 
ocean that needed to be mapped. They wanted to do that in 13 years, so 2017 to 2030. And it was like, how are they going to do this? This is so much territory to cover. And the big answer to that, the big innov innovation that they were relying on was drones, um, that they were going to send out these ocean drones to cover a huge amount of territory that had never, never been done before. So I visited one of these drone making warehouses out where you are in uh, near San Francisco in Alameda called Sail Drone. And I watched some of these drones coming off the assembly line and they can do incredible things. Um, one of these drones, one of their drones recently went through a hurricane and captured the first footage inside a hurricane. Um, you know, just something that no one had ever seen before. Um, ocean mappers call these drones, they're like black magic for ocean mapping. They're doing incredibly incredible things. But a part of me, um, I'm really romantic about uh, expedition and exploration. And when I saw these drones, I mean, they made me a little bit sad because I sort of want humans to still be out there exploring. Um, why would we give up such an awesome job? But um, the argument for drones is that they're, they're cheaper, they're more environmentally friendly, they're more accessible. So developing countries that don't have good maps would might finally be able to make these maps. So, and a lot of ocean mappers who've been doing this for decades, they're, they're over mapping. Like they've been through the Northwest Passage so many times and they just want the job done already. So they're not romantic about the physical mapping anymore. They wanna make the map and move on to more interesting questions. Tell me about some of the, the characters in, in, in the book. The story is fascinating. Uh, one character who uh, uh, I was particularly in, intrigued with talking of uh, cartographers is a woman called uh, Marie Tharp. I'd never heard of her before. Tell me about her and why she's important in your narrative. Oh, she's fascinating. I'm so glad that you brought her up. So this is actually a map hanging on the wall behind me that um, it's a map that relies on Marie Tharp's work. Um, it was published in National You might Geographic. describe it, um, yeah. uh, Laura, because some, many people for the show will just be watch, uh, will be listening, so they won't be able to see the map. Right, okay, well, it's, um, it's a map of the Indian Ocean, and it's really the first modern glimpse of the seafloor that uh, humanity ever had. And Marie Tharp, this woman who works at the Lamont Earth Observator Observatory in the 1950s and 1960s, had a huge hand in making this map. And what was kind of fascinating about her life was that she came into ocean mapping at a time when there was a phenomenal amount of uh, ocean mapping being done for the Cold War and for military purposes. Um, women were not actually allowed to go to sea at that point in time. And uh, Marie Tharp had a lot of experience in plotting and charting. And so she managed to sort of turn this situation to her advantage. Um, at Lamont, women weren't even allowed to step on the gangplank of the ocean mapping vessels. So she did all her work back on shore. So she had this sort of partner in crime, Bruce Heason, and he would bring back the soundings that he collected out at sea. He would bring them back to Marie Tharp and she would sort of painstakingly hand plot all these, these maps. And she ended up discovering, not many people know this, but she ended up discovering the, the mid-ocean ridge system, which snakes through the middle of the Atlantic um, and kind of continues around the world for 40,000 miles. And the discovery of this is, is really what led to the um, widespread acceptance of plate tectonics um, throughout, the, throughout the 60s. And so it was just a huge shakeup in the scientific world. It literally like sh changed the world beneath our feet because all of a sudden, we had an understanding that the world was, was the land we're standing on is not stable and static. It's constantly moving ocean at, and it, and it's in an odd way, far. it sort of conforms to the, the I, I, Einstein's version of the universe. Yeah. Yeah. You could say that it really just upended everything we knew. It was a huge historical moment. We did and a show on Einstein. Of course he knew everything yesterday. Some things, um, Laura don't seem to have changed. As you know, uh, Marie Tharp did all the, the early leg work, uh, a remarkable woman. And even today, uh, you feature another young woman, Cassie Bongiovanni, who I think you know works for Vescova. Tell me about people like um, Bongiovanni. What's so inspiring, romantic, or perhaps concerning about their role now in, in the deepest map? 
Yeah, so Cassie Bongiovanni, the, the book sort of kicks off with her story where she's about to graduate from the University of New Hampshire's mapping program, which is sort of like the Ivy League finishing school of uh, ocean mapping. And she fully intends to get a job on a government vessel, you know, sort of doing sort of very conservative safety of navigation work where she'd be sort of mapping a port and making sure that ships could come in safely. But then randomly she gets a... Uh, a job on board this five deeps expedition and she goes around the world figuring out the deepest points of every ocean on earth something that had never been done before and what she discovered and what i discovered through her work was that ocean mapping is just so much more than safety of navigation i mean there's so many incredible mysteries down there to to solve so you know the the origin of life question that i mentioned there's there's shipwrecks there's human history buried on continental shelves there's natural disasters that are caused by the seafloor like tsunamis and earthquakes and so there's just so much more going on there and i really came away from that having my mind blown and, and realizing how extreme and bold the seafloor is you mentioned that still much of what we know about or what what we don't know about the ocean uh, dominates our thinking. Uh, you talked earlier also about Tharp and the Atlantic seafloor. Which oceans are, are best and least known? I'm assuming the ones less accessible, the Antarctic or the Arctic Ocean, less is known about them, especially if they're covered by ice. Mm -hmm. Yep. The Southern Ocean and the Arctic Ocean are the ones that are sort of the least mapped, the Indian Ocean as well, but um, the Southern and the Arctic Oceans are, they were covered by ice, so it was very hard to, to map them. And only now that um, in climate change and, and um, you know, big chunks of the Arctic and the Antarctic melting, um, we are finally getting a picture of what those, uh, those passages and inlets and forts look like at a great environmental cost, of course. What are those environmental costs? Well, you mentioned them earlier. Anything else? I mean, what about the life at the bottom of the ocean? Is there any? I mean, you're with, I, I, again, I fall into all the cliches. I know very little about this. I always assume that once you get below a certain, uh, a, a certain height in the ocean, there is no more life. But I, I guess there's different forms of life. Uh, yeah, so um, that's actually what you're referring to there is actually called like the Azoic theory. Um, it was really popular in the Victorian era. They thought that below a certain depth. Well, I am a Victorian character, unfortunately. <laughs> Sorry, not to shame you for your deep sea knowledge. But um, but yeah, it was it, for years and years and years, people thought that there was no uh, life in the bottom of the ocean, that as you went further and further down, there was just nothing there. It was just kind of an abyss. But what we're finding out right now is that there actually is a lot of diversity down there. Um, we really have no idea of how much, how mu all the different kinds of life that live down there. Um, the Natural History Museum of London just released a study a week or two ago where they cataloged all the literature, the scientific literature that had been done on just one small part of the ocean. It's this area called the Clarion Clipperton fr Fracture Zone, which is in the middle of the Pacific. It's a prospective mining site. Um, they cataloged all the, all the life that had been found there, and they found 5,000 some new species, they thought, in just that one little area. And 90% of them had never been described or named. They were entirely new to science. So it was really one of those places where the more we explore, the more we find. And what about the absence of noise and light uh, again one of the cliches of the ocean the, the deepest ocean is its darkness and its silence is that right yes it's very i mean it's it would be silent for us but for many other animals marine mammals in particular they communicate with sound sound travels really far underwater and that's why we use sound to map the ocean you can't use light to map the ocean. It, it disappears really rapidly in the deep sea or in or just below the surface, really. There's no light in the deep sea. And then as you get down, you know, it's it's very dark, it's very cold, it's very static. So the water is quite sluggish. Um, you know, in many ways, it looks like a bit of a moonscape, a very inhospitable landscape. And so I think that's why people sort of have, you know, quite naturally, a lot of fears of it. They think of it as sort of the ends of the earth. Um, the, the, the deepest part of the ocean is called the Hadal zone. So it has these 
associations with hell and Hades. And I mean, the Titan implosion, I mean, from so many people, I think it just hit this, this button in us that makes us so terrified of the deep sea and what's down there um, because it's deep and dark and scary looking. Yeah, and we tend to mythologize it into narratives like Atlantis. I mean, is it conceivable that we could discover an Atlantis down there? An underwater city, like a lost underwater city? Yeah. Well, I don't, I mean, I don't think Atlantis like that. One fa fascinating thing that I found out was that um, in my book, I actually go to Florida and I go diving with underwater archaeologists on the continental shelves. So the continental shelves of the seafloor, it's about 27% of the seafloor. Yeah, and... Um, like uh, these some of these archaeologists, uh, Sean, uh, Joy, and Morgan Smith, you have some pictures from a piece that you ran uh, in, um, in Hakai magazine recently. Yeah, that's right. That's right. I think this is a fantastic story. They're using ocean mapping to discover uh, artifacts that have been buried in the seafloor um, about... The, the drowned landscapes on Earth, it, it, it accounts 27% of continental, the, the seafloor is continental shelf, and early humans used to live there. After the last ice age, a lot of water was released into the ocean and it drowned these landscapes. So there's a lot of human history buried on those continental shelves, and we've really only begun to pick through um, the beginnings of, of early human history. And yeah, you, you in, in your piece, you note artifacts which would found or dredged up, which we haven't seen for tens, hundreds of thousands of years. Mm -hmm. That piece I'm holding right there is, you know, no one's touched that in 3,000 years. This is um, a triangular, looks like a, uh, a, a potato chip. or a, <laughs> Yeah, that's how I nacho. describe it. Yeah, it's about, it's about the size of a tortilla chip, as you can see there. And um, this is a bit of mining debris. So people would be smacking rocks together, trying to make an arrowhead or something like that. And this would be left over. And so you're able to find these quarry sites where people were hacking away at stones and uh, using modern mapping techniques. And then the hope is that you find these quarry sites and then you're able to find a camp nearby because people are not lugging rocks all over the landscape. So these are just really early attempts to find some of these early human habitations that, that are down on the continental shelf. Laura, you mentioned government agencies. Uh, you noted that Cassie Bongiovanni, when she graduated from the University of New Hampshire, she was going to work for a government agency, and she ended up working for Victor Vescova, private explorer. Is there an equivalent of NASA when it comes to the oceans? Yeah, so that would probably be NOAA, which is the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. Um, but it doesn't have anywhere near the profile that NASA does um, and nowhere near the budget or, or money either. So no one, you don't see any sort of cool dads walking around in NOAA shirts. People don't really know it the same way that they know NASA, but they do incredible work. They've been um, mapping the seafloor for years and years and years, but their budgets are quite strapped. So they have to highlight parts of the seafloor that are the highest priority, and they can't really branch off to do a ton of exploration the way a government agency like NASA would be able to do. Well, your new book, uh, you, 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 your previous book was The Imperiled Ocean. The, the new book is The Deepest Map, uh, The High Stakes Race to Chart the World's Oceans. Congratulations, uh, Laura, on that book. Um, finally, a couple of pieces of advice. You've given this a great deal of thought. You've joined these adventures. You understand the romantic uh, attraction, but you also understand the dangers. What? What sense would you articulate when it comes to this high stakes race to chart the world's oceans, not just to chart them, but to explore them? This is unavoidable for better or worse. How should we go about it? A couple of uh, observations in, 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 in terms of making sense of this rather than just reactionary remarks saying people shouldn't go down there, which sounds to me rather absurd. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Yeah, I mean, so we were talking earlier about mining and extraction and, and the questions that people have as soon as you bring up a map of the seafloor, the first map of the seafloor, and their mind immediately sort of flicks to, to mines. Maps and mines are sort of tied. 
But I think that we should keep in mind that a map is, it's just a neutral tool. I mean, you can use it for good, you can use it for evil, you can use it for all kinds of things in between. So as we're sort of starting out on this um, new era where we could be learning more about the seafloor than ever before, we kind of have to keep in mind that um, we could make a new world when we, when we map the ocean, that we could use this map for something different than we've been doing in the past. So instead of just kind of using it to highlight new areas for extraction, we could use it to ask different questions like, you know, uh, are we going to protect the space? Are we, are we going to conserve it? Are we going to make sure that everybody can kind of sustainably use it? Or are we going to continue with the path that we've been on since the colonial area? era where we just kind of uh, have these one hit resources. I have to admit, I'm not particularly optimistic. Are there international <laughs> agencies, the United Nations, for example, which is uh, addressing these issues? Not that the United Nations is also always very effective. Seems yeah. to be another organization mired in bureaucracy and political interests. Yeah, I mean, the UN cannot really fix the problem. They are there to... Um, create arenas for conversation and discussion. People often think that they can lob off these problems on the UN, but um, if you make an ocean treaty that protects the seafloor, you really have to get everybody to abide and uh, follow the rules of that regulation. So, you know, it's really on all of us to to make sure that that, that area gets protected. But I, I share your your pessimism. It's, it's, uh, it's a big task ahead of us. We were able to pull off something like this in the 1950s and 1960s when we protected Antarctica and we signed the Antarctic Treaty. But that was a very different post-war period where the world was kind of coming together around big collective goals. We need something like that for the ocean right now. But whether we have that sort of zeitgeist going on, I I'm not entirely sure.